Good evening. I'm just going to wait for a moment for everybody to log in on Zoom. Oh, wait, we don't have to do that. All right. Wonderful. A live audience. I love it. My name is Greg Gorga, Executive Director of your Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. So great to see everybody here. You are going to listen tonight to Dearest Minnie, A Sailor's Story by Leslie Compton. I want to thank, uh, let's hear it for all of you for being here. All right. Uh, I want to thank my board members who are in the audience. If you could raise your hands, please. All right. Thank you very much. They signed my paycheck, so I got them to say that. Uh, I mean, uh, no. and uh, Ken Clements, past board president, I, th I think is here tonight, Ken. All right. Ken made the mistake of hiring me here 15 years ago. All right. Yeah. I want to thank Marie Morris Rowe. Unfortunately, she could not be with us here, but she is our lecture series sponsor. So thank you, Marie. I know you're out there. She'll, she'll see the recording. Um, I want to thank our Pete Giordano and Greg Martellato and One Vine Wines uh, for their donations. And I also, tonight we have uh, some special guests. Well, uh, one of them is one of our board members, but we did invite uh, the board members at the Santa Barbara Club because in uh, 1908, when the Great White Fleet visited here, the Santa Barbara Club invited all the officers from all those ships to dine with them during their entire stay here. So uh, a wonderful club here in Santa Barbara, and they treated those uh, officers very, very well. So yeah, let's hear it for them. Uh, this uh, is being recorded by TV Santa Barbara. Uh, it will be up on our website in one or two weeks, so we hope you'll visit and see that. Um, before I, I bring Leslie up, I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on here. How many have seen our whales exhibits? Yeah. All right, well, if you, if you have not, please uh, come back soon to do that. Uh, we opened uh, Whales Are Superheroes, a permanent new exhibit. Uh, a part of an uh, environmental alliance of 14 organizations, mostly museums, but garden, uh, gardens as well, uh, throughout Santa Barbara County on climate change. And we talk about how whales help uh, with the absorption of CO2 to produce oxygen. Uh, we have w uh, two professional artists on display through July, uh, Kelly Klaus and John Barron. We have over 700 pieces of children's art on display in these temporary exhibits as well. And if you have not been in the theater for the uh, Under the Sea in, uh, uh, in the Eyes of a Child uh, experience called Whale of a Tale, uh, that alone is worth uh, coming back to visit. So do uh, visit and see all those before the end of July. We um, <clears throat> have resumed our curated cocktail uh, events on the second Thursday of each month out on our beautiful patio. Uh, those are free for our Navigator Circle members and I think just $20 for our Santa Barbara Maritime Museum members. Uh, so look on our website, SBMM, for, uh, for uh, that, and you could sign up at the bottom for our, our emails if you're not getting our emails. On June 11th is our annual fundraiser, Paddle Out for San SBMM. It's at Ledbetter Beach. Uh, so if you are a paddler in any form or shape, uh, we hope to see you out there. There's information about that on the website as well. And then our lecture next month is June 16th. Uh, the Surfer and the Sage, A Guide to Survive and Ride Life's Waves by Sean Thompson. If you don't know Sean, he's an amazing speaker. Uh, he is the 1977 world champion surfer. Uh, uh, Phil, uh, produced the film uh, Busting Down the Door and just an all-around great guy. Uh, with July 3rd on our patio, we'll have a sea glass pop-up with uh, about half a dozen or more vendors. Uh, so join us for that. And then July 21st, our lecture is The History and Importance of hydrography, hydro, hydrography, oh my gosh, uh, by Charles Brennan. And if you don't know what that is, neither do I, you'll come to the lecture and learn that. And, that <laughs> it, right? um, and then I uh, want to uh, let you know that we are planning another trip to San Ignacio Lagoon to go interact with the whales in February, late February 2023. So uh, contact us if you're interested in joining us on that. It is an amazing experience. Uh, you get to touch and uh, interact with the gray whales. Uh, hopefully you're fi following us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, get our monthly uh, uh, current e e email newsletter and our updates. If not, again, sbmm.org at the bottom of the page. All we need is your name and email address for that. I want to thank all of you who are members of the Maritime Museum. A lot of you are members of our flagship society, have us in your planned giving, and many of you are Navigator Circle members. 
thank you, thank you, thank you for that. We could not do this work without you. And I got to tell you too, our uh, nationally recognized uh, award-winning education program, Maritime on the Move. Our education staff have been so busy doing that again uh, with the schools are getting out here again, which is really wonderful. And I think in the first week of June, we start doing, I think, 30 classes uh, with Santa Barbara, City of Santa Barbara Parks and Rec Nature Camps. Uh, uh, the, that Maritime on the Move gets kids to explore their own backyard. And that's just a wonderful program. And adults can do it too. It's on our website. Uh, we do a, have a program for Carpinteria Beach. Uh, here at the harbor and also Flacco Lake. If you had not been up there, uh, you want to check that out. I also should mention that uh, in the audience tonight is another good friend of the museum, Neil Graffy. Neil, where are you? All right. Wonderful. Yes, there you are. All right. Um, there is a book in our uh, store that Neil was a uh, co-author of, Murder at the Potter Hotel, and it includes the story of the Great White Fleet visit. So you want to uh, check that out. So uh, Leslie was originally uh, scheduled to do this lecture in March 2020. I'm not really sure what happened, why we didn't get to, get to that. Uh, she must have been busy, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> Leslie began writing this book 20 years ago after discovering a large section of her postcard collection, which had been inherited from her grandfather's cousin, were from a sailor on the USS Virginia, writing to his sweetheart while sailing with Teddy Roosevelt's Great White Fleet around the world from 1907 to 1909. A longtime lover of American history, she became fascinated with this historical era and event and spent years researching in libraries and museums across the country to draft the book, which brings to light a typical sailor's life during this period. A part of the as part of the process, she was published in Postcard Collector magazine with an article describing her extensive research on the Great White Fleet using postcards as illustrations. Leslie began writing as a teenager, sending her first story to Seventeen magazine uh, to receive second prize. Most of Leslie's adult life has been spent as a professional musician and in teaching elementary school, childbirth education, and nonfiction writing. Leslie moved to Southern Oregon in 2001 where she enjoys writing, teaching, and attending classes in Ashland and Medford through the Southern Oregon University. And she recently completed her third book, The Forgotten Artist, the inspiring life story of trailblazing female artist, Evelina Nunn Miller, and is currently working on her fourth book. So please join me in welcoming Leslie Compton. I get more light. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming. This is a large group. And thank you to the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum that's held on and kept me going. We had a date. It didn't work out. We had another date. It didn't work out, but they didn't give up. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. One of the nice things, I want to talk to a little bit um, about postcards themselves, because postcards made a big difference to this book. And this was a craze during this period of time. And I want to talk a little bit about the history of the postcards. Um, you, he already told you that I inherited these postcards at 10 years old from my grandfather's cousin. And I'm sure I inherited them because nobody wanted them. Uh, you know, I was only 10, what am I going to do with them? But they were gorgeous postcards of around the world, places I what, didn't even know about. But rainy days, I'd get out the albums and I'd look over the pages and, you know, something to do. And every time we moved, I carted the boxes with me. Uh, and in the 60s, living in an apartment, I went to an antique show and uh, there was somebody selling postcards. So I invited him over to my place, because I had over 250 postcards. I thought, oh boy, maybe I can make some money. <laughs> and he came over to my place, and he did. He spent about an hour looking over all the postcards, and he said, um, about five cents a piece. <laughs> and luckily, luckily, I kept hold of them. Because I thought, you know, these came from my family. I need to know what where they came from and the story behind. 
So I started collecting my own collection of postcards, and I did begin to take them out of the album. The old albums were all black paper, and I learned that, and I have a postcard I'm gonna show you that you can see. The corners of the black always show through on the postcards if kept too long. So they need to be taken out of the postcard album. And uh, so I took them out, began to put them in chronological order, and began reading them. Found out they were from a sailor with the initials of WC, which I had no clue. Nobody in my family had those initials. I had to find out who this person was. And as was stated, years of research. And one of the places I went was Annapolis, and I spent at least two or three days in their library. I've got to find out who this person is. And I was able to do that by his enlistment day, where he lived, blah, blah, blah. And find it, finally found out his name was Maurice, and he was a first-class musician. Well, now I knew, knew a little bit about what I had, and I went to a postcard club. I was living in, in New York at the time, and we were told, bring something to share. And I thought, I don't know very much about what's going on. I brought the postcards, and everybody said, oh my goodness, this is the Great White Fleet. And me, like most people, said the Great White what? You know, I, I here I had been teaching school for years. I'd never heard of the Great White Fleet. They also said, you have to write a book. And I hadn't written a book before, but boy, was I excited. I delved in, like I said, years of research to find out what this place was about. I went to every postcard uh, show, and this was 1996 when I started. Um, and postcard collecting was still very popular. And so I went to all the shows. The most I would pay for a postcard was $65, okay? And there were many postcards that were more than that. Forget the five cents. <laughs> so let me show you a little bit about the postcards. The first postcards that were issued were called non-divided back, all right? The only place that you could write on that postcard was on the picture side. And I'll show you a back um, that, and it, you know, everything, all the mail was handled by hand in those days, not by machine. So that if there was anything but the address on the other side, they were thrown in the trash. Postcard publishers got into picturing battleships because in that day and age, having the number of battleships meant power. Every country was in a powerful, uh, uh, we uh, uh, have more than you. There was a rivalry be between uh, England and Germany and America, depending on where you were. Germany, Germany said, we, we're more powerful than you. England said, we're more powerful than you. And so the publishers got involved in publishing the um, battleships. And they published them like uh, we used to collect b uh, baseball cards. So they were in a series. So this publisher published the in the round, half round circle, every single uh, battleship. I have to show this one to you. This is an undivided card, and because I live in Oregon, this publisher looked closely. He hand, paint, hand glued glitter. And do you see the glitter? On every one of his cards, hand glued glitter. Okay? And glitter in the ocean, in the water, there's glitter over here. Hand glued glitter. And he has a postcard of every single battleship. Okay, this is the back of an undivided card. Again, even the top says, this side for address only. In 1907, right before the fleet left, then they became divided the way we know them today. 
So here's another undivided back. And as you can see, this publisher in every single card had the emblem up on the top. Yeah, aha, uh -huh, I heard that. I need to show this to you because even though it's dry dock, every ship was, it was named after a state except the Carisage. And in the, this was all brass filigree around the outside and inside was the emblem of each state on the ships. We were the only country, by the way, that um, had white ships. Every other country had what we call today, you know, battleship gray. Here's another postcard, and that publisher again. Every, every single, it, it was fun for me. I, cl I collected all of these. I couldn't wait, like post postcard. This publisher I really liked. Every, every ship, include, not just battleships, he had a different bouquet of flowers. These were roses, sometimes he had daisies, sometimes they'd be in the round, the ship, sometimes they'd be oblong. Uh, every postcard is totally different. Then there's a publisher who decided also he wanted to take a picture of every crew. So if you can see, every crew had um, Marines as well as sailors, or they were called blue jackets. The Marines are up here. Okay, and if you notice, down here is a goat. <laughs> Almost all the ships had a mascot aboard, whether they be dogs, goats, cats. Uh, the Kentucky had a pet pig, and um, so that's, that's why I, I have to put that up there. At this point, we're going to get into why uh, we had the fleet um, in the first place. Roosevelt was an assistant Navy um, commander and before he was president and vice president and one of the things he wanted was a powerful Navy. Even at that point he wanted a powerful Navy. He said that you have to be able to be powerful. You must learn that during peacetime not wartime. So finally, when he became president after the death of McKinley, then he could make his wish come true. He decided that he wanted to, long before, to attempt a world cruise towards the last of his pregnancy. I said that the other day, pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> Presidency. And what he, what he did, the rest of the world wanted to do a world cruise too. But Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt and his personality, he wanted to be first. Carry the big stick, okay? And the other reason why other countries did not accept, uh, even think about a world cruise was because of the coal that was needed for the travel. The ships ended up having to be recalled usually about every 10 days. They used about 90 tons of coal per day. So that's a lot of coal. And so our ships weren't even a fleet yet until 1906. We didn't have fleets, they were just individual and they just were right along the shore, kind of protecting all the shoreline. So Roosevelt changed that. Finally, Congress agreed in 1906 to end up having two fleets, the Pacific Fleet and the Atlantic Fleet. And the Great White Fleet was called the Atlantic Fleet. It wasn't until years after this event where they titled the Great White Fleet. It was the Atlantic Fleet. Roosevelt decided he wasn't going to tell people that he was doing this tour. He did not even tell his cabinet. He told only top officers, but they had a discussion with the joint board of Army and Navy, because they had heard rumors that Roosevelt might attempt a tour, 
and they were not happy about it. But Roosevelt, again, to his personality, and I quote, I am the commander in chief. My decision is absolute in this matter. And he also said, there is enough money to send the battleships to San Francisco, and if you don't allocate any further monies, they can just stay in San Francisco. So as far as the officers knew, that's as far as we were going. They didn't know that it was going to be a world crew, a cruise until the day that they left Hampton Roads, Virginia. Because Roosevelt, in his yacht, the Mayflower, had the officers for breakfast. And he told them at that time, that's the day they're departing, right? Uh, we're going to go around the world. He needed to choose a commander. And what he had problems doing, by the way, this is a great card. Roosevelt's chair is the empty one. Roosevelt was the, he actually got a Nobel Prize. The Japanese and the Russians in 1904, you know, they had this, this war. The Japanese won, almost depleting the entire Russian Navy. Japan wanted Russia to pay for the the war and all the ships that they lost. And Roosevelt said, no way, you know, you won the war. Japan was very upset. And Roosevelt was concerned that as they go around the world, there might be trouble in Japan. On the back of this card, by the way, are all the people uh, that were sitting at that table. This um, picture is upstairs. This is Robley Evans. He was chosen to be the commander of the fleet. This is an early picture of him, however. Uh, this was taken a little bit after the Civil War. He and Roosevelt were good friends. This is 1906, I believe it says. And this is Robley Evans when he took charge of the fleet. He was an old man. He was suffering from wounds from the Civil War. He was suffering from gout. And uh, many times <laughs> he ended up leaving the cruise uh, in Paso Robles. <laughs> right, because there was hot springs there. So he thought that he could recover. So the second in command, which is interesting, the second in command was Admiral Charles Thomas. He was overweight, had heart problems, and in eight months he was going to be retired. His doctor suggested he not go. Admiral Charles Sperry was next in command. He recently suffered from an illness, unknown illness, and his doctor said, nope, can't go. Rear Admiral William Emery was the fourth one in command, and he had a reputation for entertaining the ladies a little bit more than was asked for. <laughs> and he was going to retire in a few months as well. What we did find out is that all of our officers were at least 10 years older than officers of the same rank in the European navies. So that was one thing that we learned on this cruise. So once the other officers were chosen, then Roosevelt said also, I will be at your court martial if anyone should badmouth I'm sure you used another word, badmouth this cruise in any way. You will be court-martialed. Because the officers said, what, what, why do we want to do this? We can, we can uh, do everything that needs to do to make our, our, our Navy better right close to shore. Why do we have to go around the world? Could not voice that out loud. Then there was a special campaign to recruit the other, the rest of the crew, and uh, unfortunately, you can't see, I don't think. This is my book. It is the um, 
painting is done by an artist who is very much like Rockwell. This was a supplement to the Boston uh, newspaper, Sunday newspaper. This was 1908. What he wanted, Roosevelt, and I love this, robust frame, intelligent, perfectly sound and healthy constitution, and free from any physical defects or malformation. <laughs> yes. So the recruiting was centered in the West and Midwest so they could get clean cut, hardworking, church going men with rosy cheeks to impress the foreign countries. No one else was recruited. Okay, which is very interesting. Now he has a, a parrot on his shoulder because when they went to the first uh, stop, the recruiting uh, members were so thrilled that they brought back parrots for the ship. They brought back monkeys. So just because there's a goat there, there are a lot more uh, animals ended up being uh, on the ships. So now that we've got everybody on board, and remember a lot of these new, group, new recruits had never even seen the ocean, but they're in the Navy now, okay? <laughs> So it took a long time to get them going once they set sail. By September, December 9th, 1907, the 16 battleships that had been chosen out of 28 in the Atlantic fleet headed for the Hampton Roads. I'm gonna show you some of the postcards that uh, were printed at the time that they ended up in, in Hampton Roads. And they were, there were 16 battleships. And there they are leaving, getting ready to leave Hampton Roads. Join the Navy and see the world. That was also coined at this time. 14,000 men were recruited and three fourths of the people that wrote and came to and applied were turned down. The only thing they had to do was read and write. Also, Roosevelt chose uh, a publisher of postcards to go with him. Uh, this was H.H. Stratton, which I thought was a bad idea because I don't like his postcards. I'll show you why. <laughs> and he also chose all the correspondents that were going on the battleships because he instructed them that when they wrote back to their papers or their magazines, that it had to be approved by a certain officer on each ship to make sure that there were no negative remarks to be had. So most of the information we learned about the 16 ships happened years later. Because of course, everything was hunky-dory. <laughs> One of the things they ended up doing, um, this is, I love this card. This is what we call a private card because cameras were around, and so sailors and everything would take their own pictures, their own cameras, and then when they went and docked and dropped anchor, they had vendors that would set up sometimes temporary um, housing booths, and they would take the camera and they would make uh, postcards from their pictures to send back home, because people weren't collecting post, uh, pictures, they were collecting postcards. So this is, uh, a postcard that was obviously taken from a sailor. And they decided that at the time, the desertion rate was nearly twice the amount that the Army had. So they incorporated better pay and recreational activities. And they ended up with a sick bay that you see here. They had a machine shop, a carpentry shop, a tailor, a shoemaker, and a sail making shop, and does anybody know why we had to have a sail making shop? <laughs> Target practice. And in my book, I have several postcards that they use the sail and they put it way out there in the ocean, and that was target practice. They had to have target practice twice a year. That was, you know, regulation. And that's what they use, they use sails. This is off from, taken from Hotel Chamberlain in Hampton Roads, and you can see the 
part of the fleet, they're getting ready to uh, depart. Here's another postcard that was just for the fleet. And this postcard, I love. I last saw this on eBay selling for $165. I don't know if it's ever purchased, but you see in the center the blue string. It's the same consistency as a shoestring. And Robley Evans, young Robley Evans, and young Roosevelt. And then when you undo the string, it opens up to the 16 battleships in an accordion style and all of the um, admirals. Interesting. $165. That was one of my $65 cards. <laughs> so they loaded the ships before they took off with all kinds of supplies. They added plum puddings, pies, they added uh, sacks of walnuts, five dozen pianos, 15,000 pounds of chocolate bonbons for the Connecticut only. The ships sank so low, and we, this was not publicized at all until after the fleet arrived, years later. They sank so low that the um, they sank so low that the armor below, and if you saw on some of the ships, there's just a faint red line that was the armor. That was to protect the ships. They sank so low that all the ships were vulnerable to attack. And some of the officers complained that the water even came up uh, to their window. They were so <laughs> loaded down. <laughs> so they're getting ready to go out to sea. And you know, we talk about pollution, they're burning coal. This again is a private card. Roosevelt stayed and watched the uh, ships leave until there was, he couldn't even see a cloud of smoke. He wrote in his biography, uh, autobiography, that this was one of the greatest feats during his pregnancy. This is not a postcard. I was lucky when I was teaching a class, I had a, uh, someone who brought in a stedometer. But it took them a long time because the ships had to sail at 400 yards apart from one another. And that was very difficult because they, there were different tonnage per ship. So they would run at uh, two or three seconds in speed faster than the other, so how do we keep everybody at 400 yards? That was not easy. Each ship uh, weighed up to 18,000 tons, and so if the, the officer of the day was in charge to make sure that it was 400 yards continuously, if it was 40 yards that he ended up uh, it, either closer or farther apart, then he had to put up a pendant uh, flag, a white flag with a red um, stripe at the bottom, and he was disciplined, you know? So the whole fleet could see, okay, look what he did, you know, bad boy. <laughs> Here they are at the shore, again, a private card, um, and if you look closely, you can see the ships. It was, wasn't the best day. Can you see them? Yeah, and they're, they're there in Virginia at Hampton Roads looking at the ships as they sail on through, saying goodbye. Because a lot of Americans were afraid they'd never return. You know, this was country that the ocean that, that people hadn't traversed before. And my gosh, uh, countries, they were concerned about uh, countries that would uh, torpedo them. There were spies all along the way. They had uh, spies from Germany and Japan and England because England was not pleased that America was first to make this world cruise. So um, the, they had auxiliary ships go for, sit out there for two weeks ahead of time to make sure 
that the fleet was protected and that they were not going to run into any difficulties. This is a great card as well. And you see the creases, it folds. And this was, a, this is a picture of some of the formation, one of the formations that they practiced out into the uh, depths of the ocean because they wanted to come in exactly like the European navies did, that we didn't until then, full speed, and then drop anchor as close as they could so that they could spray all the spectators on shore <laughs> with water. <laughs> sometimes this worked, and sometimes it didn't, as you'll find out, because sometimes there were a couple of times when, when one ship rammed another, but um, we didn't know that either until years later. <laughs> I want to show this. This is not a postcard, but this kind of gives you an idea of how they, where they were going. And you can see at the very beginning, Hampton Roads, Virginia. Okay? And so they traveled. Um, they, here's Hampton Roads. Come over here to Trinidad, which was their first stop where they ended up getting um, their uh, parrots and uh, you know, monkeys. Now what was difficult there was that they were not received well because that was an English colony and that was how Britain was getting back to us, you know. So uh, the, the president there uh, decided he was ill and couldn't receive us. Uh, on and on and on it went and that was not the case. So you can see that they traveled around South America, went up the coast, uh, our coast, Pacific coast, to Seattle, went on around, and I know that if I go out in front, it's not recorded correctly, but they went on to Hawaiian Islands, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and then to Japan, China, which was a big problem, up through the Suez Canal, Gibraltar, and then home. A long, long trip. I had debated about what I wanted to talk about. Sometimes I talk about, um, you know, the crossing the line, which is really fun. I have great postcards in the book. But this was, um, this fascinated me. Coaling process really fascinated me because it's a dirty, dirty job, but absolutely necessary. I think I said it every 10 days, they had to make sure that they had a coaling station and they had to hire colliers from other countries because we didn't have enough to bring the coal in. And each ship, it took four days to coal. And what they would do is that they would first sand the decks because all the decks were wood and sand the decks so that the uh, ash from the coal that they would bring up uh, would not mingle with the wood of the deck. So everything was sanded, and you can see the derricks, and, and those were lifted, all the bags of coal dust were lifted onto what was called a lighter, which is like a flat barge, uh, just for slow, you know, uh, very short distances. If they were in a foreign country, then the barge would go out so nobody could see and they'd dump the ash. If they were in American country, uh, state or city, then they didn't bother, just dumped over the side. Saved a lot of time to just dump the coal in the ocean. So the, um, after the hold was cleared out, then a division, and that's four ships, would dock and coal at the same time. And usually they had the musicians were playing ragtime music. That way they got the coalers working and moving faster because this was important to do it as quickly as possible because in wartime that would be urgent. So the um, Maximum time that a man could be down in the hold of a collier was 30 minutes because it would be about 150 degrees down there. So there would be ice water in buckets for the sailors when they got out of the hold uh, to wash them off and the next crew, the next shift 
would then go down. And this happened 24 hours. You know, they just didn't rest at nighttime. Um, the shifts, everyone was involved. This was taken, and I'll show you his picture. This was taken from somebody who actually was on the Kentucky, USS Kentucky. But this was taken in uh, 1911. He was a um, lifetime uh, sailor. But I thought that this was a great picture from the crow's nest, because you can see on one side where the coal dust was, the rigs, how they're taking care of everything. I liked the picture. I thought it, this is the man who took, he was a friend of Maurice. I have to put him in to give him credit. When they emerged from the hold, only the whites of their eyes showed. And all regulation uniforms, of course, were dismissed during this time. They could wear anything they wanted to during coaling. And when they got through with the crews, each ship broke about 280 shovels during the whole cruise. Here's another one. These are our postcards that were private postcards. And um, you know, some of them moved, obviously. They're a little blurry. But they made sure that they had a, you know, a good time of it at the same time. But I just, I can't imagine, uh, down below, those that worked in the furnaces, they were called the black gangs. And they hardly got leave because they couldn't get the coal out from under their fingernails, so they were always black, which Roosevelt did not want any deformity to show with anybody that went on leave in a foreign country. So many times they did not get any leave for months. And uh, within a few months, a lot of them showed signs of weight loss and mental illness. Some of them had to be uh, sent to hospitals because they're down there in the hold of the ship all this time. So after they coaled, and every stop, by the way, was because they needed coal. It wasn't because we want to see this great country. Here's another picture of after shoveling coal. And bear in mind, there are no African Americans on the ship. Back home, however, everybody was involved in the white fleet. And the people were purchasing uh, toys that were made out of ships purchasing uh, sailor uniforms for their kids. And England even created a board game like chess where miniature uh, battleships were the, uh, instead of pawns. Songs were created, poems were written, Prudential Life Insurance superimposed the battleships uh, on Gibraltar on their advertisements. Books were published for children and for adults. And you could buy uh, colorful tins. Uh, early on, I did see those on eBay. I have not seen them in years. All showing the, the uh, battleships in all sizes. And of course, the postcard publisher really got involved. The next stop after they went all around uh, South America were the Straits of Magellan. Now this was fearful. There were a whole lot of ruin, uh, rumors about what would happen when they went through the Straits. Because at that time, there's 360 miles. Remember the Panama Canal was in construction at that time. So they had to go all around the Horn. And 360 uh, miles passage, a uh, wide, wide uh, varies from one and a half miles on either side to 25. The fog was always so thick that they could not see the boats ahead of them. So they had searchlights and they had a chip log. And that's basically a log that was set out at a certain distance. And by using uh, floodlights, 
they could see the spray, the, the boat, the ship behind, could see the spray of that log, and that's how they determined how far they were from another ship. Not, not an easy task. The other thing was unpredictable currents. You're coming into the Pacific Ocean from the Atlantic Ocean, okay? Heavy winds, heavy, great squalls and hurricane type winds, and those were nicknamed Wally Walls, Willy Walls. And rumors were that those winds could just lift a battleship out of the water. So all kinds of fears getting through that current, that area. So once they got through, then they went to Mexico and did their target practice. And their first stop was San Diego. Boy, were they excited to be back into the United States. First, they had to go to Paso Robles, of course, because uh, he, uh, another ship, uh, took Evans to Paso Robles. He said, I'll be fine. I'm going to rest here, and I'll meet all of you in, in San Francisco. Of course, that didn't totally materialize. This is the itinerary uh, in San Diego. It's very similar to the itinerary of every single port that they stopped. There were all kinds of events. All of the cities up and down the coast were in competition. Who could raise the most money? Who could have the most recreational activities? On and on and on. It really was a little, a little bitter. <laughs> April 14th. That's when the ships arrived, but they couldn't drop anchor at San Diego because San Diego's port was too shallow. So they had to drop anchor farther out from Hotel Del Carnado, which San Diego people were most upset. Well, you come on out here anyway. We're all standing on the shore waiting for you. you know, a lot of people were upset with that. What greeted the ships and the officers in San Diego were the wives of the officers, some of the officers. Unbeknownst to the officers, they decided, because every day, what was going on on the ships, the recreational activities, the dinners, the balls, were, were publicized in the newspaper. And they thought, oh, I want some of this. Why should my husband have all the glory? So they took a train, went across country, and some of the women had three trunks full of ball gowns to wear. And they met the officers, their husbands, in San Diego. I haven't heard, but I can imagine the officers weren't too pleased. So they stayed, um, and they actually followed up the coast of California, and then in Seattle, they rented um, a German ship, the ben Brenner, Brennan, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, and they continued to follow the crew and the ships through the rest of the crews. They did not want to be left out. So the bickering continued up and down the coast. In San Diego, it said that there were local boats that came out to greet the ships, and the local boats were carrying 30,000 oranges. How somebody count, counted those, I don't know. And this began the first parade, because in South America, they didn't do a parade. They started parading as soon as they got to San Diego. 5,000 uh, men and Marines would parade um, to about three to five miles. In San Diego, it was three. And that helps how come they had a shoemaker shop on board. <laughs> Maurice hated the parades. There were so many people that in San Diego, then they did not anticipate the huge crowds. So the poor men on board, only 75 per ship could have leave. There just was not enough room in the city. So to eliminate all the problems that San Diego seemed to be having, the high school uh, principal in Santa Barbara 
went to San Diego and he observed the parade and everything else, took notes to make sure that when they came to Santa Barbara, that was not going to be the case. We're better, we're better. So in San Diego, however, they mailed, the men mailed over a, a million postcards. A million postcards. They had to set up special post offices for these men because regular post office could not, could not handle it. This is a uh, private card also. Minnie had a brother, Frank, who just wanted to be a photographer. And this is his picture. And they traveled to Newport Beach to see the ships. And you can see them way in the distance. I have to have that one. And this title, this card is actually titled, Where's Aunt M? And they went with Aunt M from Santa Ana uh, to watch the ships. And here they are, after San Diego, they went to San Pedro. And the thing that was amazing to them, more people showed up at San Pedro than did in San Diego. A hundred thousand people on shore. A hundred thousand people. You're talking about 1908, for heaven's sakes, you know. It's just unheard of. Many of the overly jealous people ended up in the water, had to be fished out, and swarmed all over the ships. The next morning, the fleet divided. Now that was not uh, something that the cities wanted. Hey, six ship, 16 ships came into San Diego. Why don't we get 16 ships? Why are you dividing? I mean, this bickering continued up and over, over and over. They marched every day before lunch. They had balloon uh, ascensions. They had prize fights. This is one of Stratton's cards. Isn't this great? <laughs> Just fabulous, I love this card. <laughs> so after every, every morning after the parade, then they ended up having a barbecue. And also, Los Angeles, this is a private card, Frank took this picture. Um, they, in the paper, they asked for volunteers. How many of you have cards, cars, automobiles, that you're willing to volunteer so that the officers one day and then the enlisted men the next day can get a tour of Los Angeles? So those with automobiles showed up, and this automobile happens to be holding Maurice. I'm sorry, I don't know where he is, but he's in that car. So I Frank took the picture. After they toured Los Angeles, then the, peep, the driver, the owner of the car, usually took the whole car load over to his house and his wife cooked this big dinner. Pretty amazing. Now, San Francisco copied Los Angeles. You know, if they can do it, we can do it. This, this was really interesting. So here's the um, American, this is a, again a private card. I can't imagine, in my book I actually, somebody had a record of how many uh, quarts of coffee, gallons of coffee were served, how many pats of butter, you know, were served, needed to feed that kind of crowd. Again, this is a Stat, uh, Stratton card. The reason why I don't like these postcards um, is because they're never clear. They're always a little bit blurry, and so that's why I didn't, I didn't think that he should have been chosen. So on April 25th, they visited for, uh, Venice, uh, Ocean Park, and Santa Monica before coming into Santa Barbara. Evans had left, as you recall, so he wasn't around, so we had to have a new commander, and this is, of course, Potter Hotel during that time. And the wives stayed at Potter Hotel, but they also complained of the high prices. And uh, when they got this to Santa Barbara, they, the sailors also complained of the high prices in Santa Barbara because, you know, they could buy, <laughs> pardon me? 
Yeah, even then, <laughs> at least they didn't have to buy gasoline. <laughs> every empty building was used as a temporary restaurant and every vacant lot was used for vendors that ended up folding their tents and following the fleet clear up through Seattle. Some of them were legal and legitimate and some of them weren't. They wanted the sailors to spend money, okay? But to give an example, in Los Angeles, they could have gotten a 50 cent beer, but it was $3 in Santa Barbara. They, <laughs> pretty good, huh? They could get a steak for $1.50, but it was $5 in Santa Barbara. So most of the men, when they had leave, they would just go ahead and go to Los Angeles because, uh, and, and actually there was a confrontation with one of the restaurants in Santa Barbara because the sailors were so upset that they were being overcharged uh, for what they needed. So, but some good things. I, this is Seattle, but it all happened in every port. This is the only picture I have. Sundays meant that people could board the ship and view it. Now what was difficult, this happened in Santa Barbara as well, um, one ship would be host. That ship had music, the bands, the orchestra, and also had food. And on the side there's a ferry who's taking the spectators out to this ship. What was difficult was that all, every, all the spectators that went on board the ship also took things home with them, souvenirs. You know, the women had nice long dresses and they took cups and saucers and spoons and anything they could get their hands on. And God forbid that an officer didn't put away like a comb or a brush in his drawer, in his bureau, because it would be gone when he went back. You know, souvenirs. When they got to uh, Australia, souvenirs, the girls took off their buttons. They snatched and pulled off the buttons off the uniforms. They wanted those as souvenirs. Uh. <laughs> so here's the parade on State Street. Looks a little bit different today. <laughs> now what's interesting, if you can look, this is the battle. And if you look, uh, okay, I'm gonna. That's the real. Yeah, so right here. And if you look closely, if you look closely, because this is called the Parade of the Flowers, actually. And days before the arrival, the newspaper asked all the residents to bring their flowers, no matter how small. And Stuart Edward White, who was the famous author in town, had charge of all the flowers. He visited the high school and gathered students to create bouquets to fit into the gun barrel of the soldiers. This was the only time this was allowed because it was never allowed again. Small groups were formed for each squadron. Remember, squadron is four ships and they took the bouquets down to the wharf in wash tubs to make sure that you know the flowers stayed fresh. And a group of women met them and put the flowers in the gun uh, barrels as the sailors passed in formation from the wharf into State Street. Now when they're in formation, by the way, they, the sailors are not allowed to get out. I mean, that can't happen. So they had to put up with the flowers in their guns. Not good. So Admiral Thomas, reluctantly, he's now in charge, agreed to uh, be carried on one of the flower floats down by six horses. The city's entire fleet of horseless carriages, seven in number, also joined the parade. And when they reached the city's plaza, the Battle of the Flowers took place. Admiral Thomas set the example by catching the bouquets while still in midair and tossing them back. That 
created the battle. Remember, everything's in the paper. So this was tried to be copied almost every place they went. Battle of the flowers, throwing flowers at the officers, you know, all, all along the way. And the next picture shows, and uh, this is also a private card. You can see the girls coming down and they all had flowers in the parade. And people dressed for the fleet. These girls are wearing all white, but even newspapers added, uh, advertised, we have the best clothes for you to wear when the fleet comes, white dresses, red sashes, um, blue hats on the ribbons, you know, everybody needed to be dressed in uh, the colors of our nation, including the waitresses at the restaurants. So Monday, <laughs> with the parade of flowers, I want to show you also um, a little bit of another country. The newspaper um, were very, like I said, all the newspapers from around the world uh, talked about the flower parade. And uh, even in Jose, San Jose, flowers were all over the train. The, the officers couldn't even see how to get on because there were so many flowers. So it was always. Um, Every place they stopped, the blue, black, blue jackets, as they were called, the sailors, uh, had horseback riding, and they had all kinds of sports events, everything to keep them occupied. Maurice said in one of his postcards, he said, I'm always glad when we leave port when we up anchor. He said, everybody's so exhausted, <laughs> you know. I, I want to, I'll check the time, I want to read a short article to you that was in the paper in Seattle when I went uh, in the library. And I love this article. It says, and I quote, 16 live bears in a, is a unique sight in any bar room. And though small, the future mascots for Uncle Sam's fighting machines made things exceedingly lively in that section of the house where the butler patrons of the butler bar and grill embed their liquid refreshments. Bing when a table has one particular lively specimen of a bear tribe waddled around and caught his chain on the table leg. There was a clatter and a crash and a shower of broken glass as the tray smashed to the floor. The success of the bears in the future years in prosperity and honor for the ships and crews to which they have attached their homage was pledged in a round of sparkling wine. And as if enthused by the sediment proposed, several cubs emitted a healthy howl. Each ship was awarded a bear cub in Seattle. Okay, and they were, I have a picture in there, they were all, all of nine pounds about, but they had to march in the parade and they had to be on ship. Now you can imagine with the parrots and monkeys. When they got to Australia, each ship was given a kangaroo. <laughs> and it goes on and on. It was like a zoo. It was like a zoo. So I wanted to show you Australia went all out in their postcards. I was fortunate enough through uh, eBay to become acquainted with a man who collected postcards who lived in Australia, Sydney. Uh, his name actually was Leslie. And he collected Australian uh, Great White Fleet cards and he gave me, this is how old all this is, floppy disk of all of the cards that he had so that I could use some of them in the uh, book. But I'll just give you a sample of the beautiful cards that they had. They actually spent so much money, $50,000, the 1908 money, for all the decorations for the cruise. Australia thought that America was coming to support them. Not just the world cruise, but here comes America. They're going to support us. 
Australian and New South Wales wanted to keep their country lily white, and they feared there would be an influx of people from Asia because of their need for more settlers. Remember, uh, Europe, I mean England, this was an English colony, and England said, we've got to have more settlers. So Australia and Wales felt that here came America, we'll get immigration from American ships. We did have a lot of sailors who jumped ships, shall we say. One, one of the battleships had to stay behind to collect as many as they could. <laughs> but they, this is, they were most disappointed after the fleet left. They all felt they had spent way too much money and that they had misunderstood what America was really doing. They arrived, when the fleet arrived to Australia, they had 42 bags of mail to be mailed back to the United States. And in the, the 46 bags, 112,326 letters and postcards were there to be mailed to the United States. Amazing. The newspaper there said, and I quote, Americans have one weakness common to men and officers. It is the craze for collecting postcards. In all parts of the world, the Americans have brought, bought postcards and they show their collections with pride. All around the lower decks, the Marines could be seen with boxes unlocked, revealing treasured postcards to admiring eyes. Here's another one out Australia. And here they are embarking. And then we go into China. I wanted to show you a little bit of China because we didn't know everything that happened in China um, till years later. China was very, you know, knew that when they landed in Japan, they, they dropped anchor in Japan, we were afraid that Japan was going to have guns on the fleet. Even though all we heard after the war with Russia was that they, you know, they didn't have ammunition, they didn't have their ships were, were sunk, um, they, no problem. But our men were prepared in case the, this was not true. But the, it was fabulous. All of Japan, beautiful, beautiful cards, I might add. So China was very upset. So China started rumors that Japan, they didn't have a good uh, trip. And they ran into, the fleet ran into a typhoon. And China put on uh, in newspapers that the fleet is now um, destroyed. They're floating out in the ocean uh, from the typhoon. Everything to make sure that it was a negative impression for the fleet. First of all, they, they talked over with Roosevelt. Um, the Forbidden City was crumbling in China. And aware of the po positive effect the fleet had in Japan, they spread these rumors. First of all, Roosevelt and China decided on Shanghai. So then China sent thousands of workers to Shanghai to build what they call pleasure uh, buildings, you know, just for the fleet. But the Navy started thinking about it and said, you know, these are dangerous currents for our ships to come to. This needs to be changed. So, okay, the city of Shefu, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, was then chosen. So more workers were hustled over to Shefu to build the pleasure uh, buildings. But the Navy said that if the ships landed there, it would add 2,000 miles and 80,000 tons of coal. So we better change it again. China was not happy. They moved again to Amoy. Then the typhoon came on land and came ashore and killed 3,000 people at that city and increased the budget because they had to rebuild everything. Here comes the fleet. 
to a million dollars at that time. Seven times more than any other country had spent. When Taft became president after Roosevelt left, he spent millions of dollars to repair the damage that we had done during the arrival of the fleet. This is inside. Uh, this is one of the, the only postcard I have. Um, this is the officers getting served a wonderful uh, dinner. This is in one of the, and this I found in a book, okay? Uh, this is the outside of that building. And they had all kinds of security all around. Policemen, all, at every door, you had to have a pass to enter. And that's all I have of China. I have this one postcard that I did locate of China. And again, it, a lot of it is false. You see up at the top, the typhoon and the 16 battleships are, are oh, that was terrible. Some of the pictures that are in the book, um, the 16 battleships lost sight of each other. And so this is, this is it for China. I have to show this one because it's unbelievable today to see something like that. Yeah. When they went to Egypt, you know, there were no fences or anything around the pyramids or sphinx. There was nothing. You could climb over all of them. And the sailors, of course, dutifully carved their initials. You know, I was here. Ah. And I, I, I always have to show that one. So they finally, they went through Gibraltar um, went through the Suez Canal in Gibraltar, and then they started flying home. They were going home, bound for home. And so more postcards, of course, were, were printed. So here they are in Hampton Roads. On the, and Roosevelt insisted that they return on Washington's birthday, February 22nd, because he was leaving office around the 1st of March for an African safari. So he insisted that they get there so that, in time. And it was raining that day. You can see all the umbrellas up. But that did not detour the spectators. In fact, they had cots all in the hallways of the um, hotel where people could stay and sleep because uh, that was all taken up. And of course, the next day, the very next day, what are they going to have? A parade, <laughs> another parade. Many postcards were published after they arrived back home. And look at this postcard. You've got all 16 of the battleships surrounding the two sailors who are now wearing a civilian clothes, um, and they're taking their picture. Several, several companies. What happened uh, while they were in a parade? The ships were painted battleship gray. Okay, and even during the cruise, um, the admirals kept radioing back saying, our white ships can be seen so much sooner than the gray ships. And they had paint with them on board. Every ship had the battleship gray paint. And Roosevelt said, no, we're not going to do it, because that would change the image of the goodwill tour that he was hoping would ensure. Because all of a sudden, if they were gray, it would mean maybe a different, a different feeling. So they painted, they took off all the brass filigree. Uh, they took, and then they put, and I'm still not clear, I'm sorry, uh, on top, they look like upside down uh, baskets, waste baskets of wire, and that was supposedly uh, for fire deterrent. And so the next time the sailors were on their ship, this is exactly um, what they looked like. And the last picture that I give you is Minnie. This was taken by Frank, and Minnie and Frank both went down to visit um, Maurice in San Pedro, and he took it, the picture then. It's Dearest Minnie is my book, but to begin with, Frank was writing to 
um, excuse me, Maurice was writing to Frank, the brother, because Maurice had had a crush on Minnie since childhood. They were school, uh, in, you know, they went to school together in Kentucky. So he figured if he could get through to the brother Frank, then maybe he had a chance. Um, so, so soon after they saw each other in Los Angeles, the, then the letters and postcards started with dearest, and they were written to Minnie. In fact, he actually proposed marriage by the time he got to Aust uh, Australia. So that's the end of my talk. And I have to have, I'd love to have questions. If anybody has a comment or things that they'd like to know, obviously, that I didn't uh, cover. Yes. Yes, that's right. Well, he did, and that's what he said. And this, this gentleman is asking the question about getting them home and forcing Congress to uh, provide the money, and he actually did. Um, but Congress was aware how excited we were as Americans, watching in, uh, in the newspaper and hearing all the news of the fleet going around the world. That also... Uh, it helped Congress say, okay, we'll, we'll fund the money to help them get home. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I want to thank you for this, Leslie. This is probably the finest collection of great white fleet pictures and cards I have ever seen. They're absolutely stunning. And the story you put together with them is absolutely fascinating. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Seven cars. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. We have a little gift for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you are welcome. Mm. And thank you all for being here. Uh, again, come back and see the whale exhibit if you haven't done so. And uh, we hope to see you back soon, especially next month with Sean Thompson. Safe home, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.